Okay, uh, welcome everybody. Uh, I'm Jacob Mann from DG Wind in Denmark, and uh, it's a pleasure to introduce the seminar series named uh, American European Collaboration on Wind Energy, which is organized by Sue Enlund Haupt from NCAR and uh, me from DTU. Uh, we have a seminar every second Wednesday of the month at this time. And uh, if you want to present something, then please uh, contact either Sue Ellen or me. Uh, please, uh, Sue, will you introduce the speaker? Yes. Um, today, we're pleased to have Dr. Raghu Krishnamurti of Pacific Northwest National Lab with us. Um, at PNNL, he leads a multidisciplinary team of atmospheric scientists and oceanographers to better understand the offshore environment for wind energy applications, which is critical for energy and national security needs. Um, he is currently principal investigator of DOE's LIDAR buoy program, the Wind Forecasting Improvement Project Phase 3, and uh, on, focused on the East Coast resource assessment and forecasting challenges, as well as the observationally driven resource assessment and coupled models or Oracle project focused on the West Coast. Um, he's also an, an instrument mentor for the DOE uh, Doppler LIDARs um, in the Radiation Measurement Program, or ARM. So, Raghu, we're looking forward to your talk today. Take it away. Great. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Sue, for the introduction. And thanks, Jakob and Sue, for uh, inviting and giving us the opportunity to kind of present some of the results that, that's, that we've been kind of populating for a few years now. Um, so it's it's been a pleasure working on this project. And, you know, I think working on um, US, off you know, US West Coast has definitely been uh, of critical importance going forward. So today I'll talk a little bit about the observations and multi-scale modeling work that we've been doing off the US West Coast. And this is truly a, a team effort. Uh, so I, I didn't want to put one person or like, you know, two people's name or three people's name. It would just crowd the slide quite a bit. So I just put uh, the buoy project team. I think that, and I'll, I'll kind of encapsulate the team members at the end of the presentation. So that you have a good memory of who's working on this. Um, so, to, so I'll start off by giving a little bit of a context uh, to um, to offshore wind and 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 in terms of how U.S. DOE is looking at it uh, and the importance of U.S. West Coast for DOE. Uh, so the U.S. West Coast is is, is typically has a very steep bathymetry, uh, going you know about two kilometers offshore. The bathymetry kind of falls down drastically, uh, and you know, uh, in the lease areas that uh, DOE and, and you know the the U.S. Department of Energy and U.S. Department of Interior are targeting, uh, that's about uh, you know 50, 60 kilometers offshore, uh, which is about thousand meters deep. So really deep waters, uh, very fast into the uh, the coastline there, uh, and and the only sort of wind turbines that can actually be put up there, of course, is floating offshore, floating offshore wind turbines. So the U.S. West Coast is primarily mostly targeting floating offshore wind turbines. Uh, the target is to kind of generate 5,000 megawatts by 2030, so it's an ambitious goal. Uh, and the lease area is about 373,000 acres, so that gives you a, a scale of how big the lease areas are. Um, they they are growing that quite a bit right now. I, I've heard recently from Boehm that they're increasing the number of lease areas in California to kind of uh, meet some of these aggressive goals. Um, and and another thing that you know really astonished me uh, initially while discussing this and kind of getting a sense of the scale of this particular project was that the floating offshore wind turbines are expected to have hub heights of what greater than 170 meters. Uh, so it's really tall wind turbines, uh, which which uh, you know given some of the characteristics that we know, and and I'll exp you know I'll kind of ex explain some of those today. It's it's really a challenge uh, for from a resource assessment perspective, um, and there was this recent floating offshore wind shot uh, that uh, that was uh, that was put out by Department of Energy uh, to solicit sort of you know information and and and, and proposals from various people uh, from you know universities and labs uh, to. Uh, to reduce the cost of floating offshore wind uh, by 70% by 2035. So again, an ambitious goal. It had a bunch of things uh, listed there in terms of reducing uncertainty of resource, uh, getting more cost-effective technologies. And then this figure uh, sort of encapsulates that sort of picture. I'm 
It was very recently, we're pleased to announce that Larry Burke from PNNL, uh, along with a lot of people here uh, who, uh, who I see, Sue and Julie, uh, won the award, uh, one of the awards, one of the two awards. Uh, the other one was from Enril, from Mike Sprague, uh, which uh, which is going to tackle this in a much larger scale. So uh, kudos to the team on that side. Uh, and, and from the DOE, from the Wind Energy Technologies Office, We'll also be. Uh, we're also currently started looking into uh, the WFIP4 sort of series, and, and WFIP has been uh, one of the flagship sort of um, uh, projects within DOE. Uh, the phase three is currently happening along the east coast, uh, and phase four is definitely going to happen along the west coast. So this this initial sort of scoping sort of project uh, that we've been doing in uh, at DOE is sort of trying to see how we can address or reduce some of these uncertainties and gaps that, that we're seeing along the US West Coast. So I was talking about reducing uncertainty and why that's a challenge with regards to hub heights. Um, so I have this, this, this slide that I, that I like to show, uh, which basically talks about the resource assessment challenges along the US uh, West Coast. So the US West Coast is 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 pretty um, amazing in terms of the amount of uh, phenomena that can happen, and sometimes more than one phenomena happens at once, right? Uh, so it gets really complicated, really uh, interesting uh, to to see how the models are performing, how the observations are behaving uh, for various cases. So off the top, the the most challenging environment that you can find um, is very shallow, stable boundary layers. You can find uh, boundary layers that go up to 40 to 50 meters. Uh, so this, it's it's pretty pretty interesting, uh, and and you can see that typically even not really stable, but you know general boundary layers on on the order of about 200 to 300 meters. Uh, so this uh, this creates a new challenge, especially when the wind turbines are about 170 meters. Uh, and and this is a map on the right showing the coastline along the coast of California, uh, where you have. Uh, you know, distinct capes that I mentioned here. So there's Cape Mendocino and Cape uh, Point Reno and Cape uh, Point Conception. Uh, so there are a lot of different capes, Cape Blanco at the top, uh, which basically, in, you know, enhances uh, or induces flow separation along these. Uh, and the predominant mean wind direction is parallel to the coastline. So at Humboldt, it's it's paddle, uh, it's basically north, you know, northerly, and at Morro Bay, which is south, this is one of the other lease areas that you know we have marked up down here. Uh, the wind is again paddle; it's about 28 degrees, kind of inclined, uh, and the wind is paddle to the coastline here. Uh, so this these capes are extremely interesting, and and they they induce uh, flow separation, which creates a lot of challenge uh, in in sighting wind turbines. And because of the because of the steep bathymetry, the 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 mountains along the coast, uh, there's also coastal low-level jets that are formed uh, along this particular region. I'll talk a little bit more about that later on. Uh, uh, there are different kind of phenomena that happens, like California expansion fans, uh, coastal fog is very prevalent in the summer conditions, um, and, and then there's also coastally trapped wind reversals, which have uh, you know uh, Kelvin wave propagation resulting in uh, flow reversals from the south, uh, atmospheric rivers. We've heard a lot about that recently. Uh, downslope wind storms like Santa Ana and Sundowner winds, just because of the, the high mountains uh, which are along the coastline there, uh, creates a challenging environment sometimes and how that impacts the marine boundary layer. Um, there's wind driven coastal upwelling. That's one of a, uh, you know an, an essential sort of a phenomena for uh, fisheries and uh, and and local uh, uh, local people try to understand uh, you know how where they go fish and and how that happens and and how would wind turbines affect coastal upwelling that's that's an important uh, assessment that we need to do um, and then there's submersible scale oceanic eddies that happen right around the near near San Francisco which which creates different sort of oceanic challenges uh, and how that impacts the marine boundary layer and then finally there are internal boundary layers and sea breezes uh, of course there because of the distance from the shore we see a little bit of an impact on them, but not too much. So this is just some of the kind of resource assessment challenges that we have at least you know, seen with the literature from the data sets that we've obtained. Uh, and and it's, it's just, it is, it is incredible uh, to see uh, how, um, uh, how challenging this environment is and, and, how, and how can we help them literally. So um, again, looking at this marine boundary layer radiation with, with stability, um, this is, this is something that you know we've been sort of interested in in trying to understand, uh, especially in stable boundary layers. 
uh, what's happening right now is because of the scale of these wind turbines, we are going above the marine boundary layer. Uh, that's sort of an unknown sort of territory in terms of what exactly the models are going to behave, how they're going to do it. We don't have observations uh, to a great degree. Uh, the technological limitations in observing above the marine boundary layer sometimes with remote sensing, uh, mainly radiosons are the only way to do it. So there are a lot of challenges associated with that and, and, and how we can look at it. Uh, and, and here, uh, we typically have about three sort of layers, which uh, most of us sort of focus on. One is the wave boundary layer, which is very close to the surface. Uh, and then the surface layer, which is typically uh, where uh, it's a constant flux layer and, and, and it's about 10% of a textbook value of the atmospheric boundary layer. And then you have the boundary layer. Uh, and, and the stability basically drives a lot of the wake propagation for wind turbines and, 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 and how um, uh, the winds, for example, there's low level jet phenomena that are observed in this particular case. So stable boundary layers are definitely more of a challenge, but in, in the West Coast, we've seen that the convective boundary layers are also uh, something that's interesting and needs to be looked into just because of the shallow boundary layers overall. So some of the key questions, I'll try to keep a track of my time here. Uh, some of the key research questions that we at DOE have been initially focusing on uh, as a part of this particular project. And I'll talk a little bit about the future work that we're doing is uh, what is exactly the wind and wave resource near the offshore wind lease areas along the California West Coast? So that was the first offload question. Uh, we hardly have any buoys that are measuring hub height winds uh, along the West Coast, uh, or at least that's publicly available, I should say. Uh, so that, that was definitely a, a big challenge. Uh, and then the second one was what are the sources of model errors at offshore wind turbine hub heights? For example, with reanalysis and WERF, uh, what are the various sources of errors uh, and, and how can we quantify them? And then uh, going offshore, it, it made uh, sense to kind of look into uh, the ocean wave atmospheric coupled modeling. Uh, and, and will an ocean wave atmospheric coupled modeling uh, for both mesoscale and microscale sort of improve hub height wind speed estimates of the US West Coast? So this topic is definitely an ongoing research. Uh, there's a lot that needs to be unpacked here. I'll, I'll show some sample sort of um, results that we have, um, but again, there's, there's more publications coming up on, on that particular aspect. But these were the three kind of key research questions that uh, we were sort of initially addressing, uh, and we ran into some interesting results, uh, some pretty mundane, but then some interesting, uh, and some that need a lot more future work. So I'll try to kind of go around uh, focusing on these three things in that order, so that it, it kind of helps uh, frame uh, the talk a little bit better. So the first question again was, what is a wind and wave resource? So uh, DOE has uh, has acquired uh, two of these uh, buoys, which are which are equipped with uh, Doppler lidars on top of them. And on the right, you're seeing a schematic or a 3D schematic of uh, of the buoy, uh, which shows which shows the various um, uh, instruments that are uh, install you know put on the turbine. Uh, these are massive buoys. Some some people call them mini boats, right? Uh, so they're really big buoys, not like the small buoys that you know we typically end up seeing. Um, they have a lot of power in terms of adding more instrumentation uh, to them. You can add more instruments if if you want to. Uh, they have surface match station uh, ADCPs, which give you ocean currents and direction, wave sensors, uh, and the Doppler lidar, which gives you profile. So basically, a two D column uh, of plus or minus two hundred meters, and it kind of is an interesting sort of a device um, or a tool to assess air scene traction processes. So, um, so we had we have two of these and we've deployed, we had deployed them, we had deployed them back in 2020 um, along the coast of California. One right near, you can see these yellow dots are where uh, the, the, the buoys were located. One right exactly at the edge of the Morro Bay lease area and the other one uh, right at the edge of the Humboldt lease area. So uh, trying to get a kind of a spatial characteristics of, of these locations. So, uh, We've deployed them for about a year. Uh, we were initially planning to deploy them at the same time concurrently, uh, uh, but we ran into some issues at Humboldt, uh, just challenging wave conditions where we encountered uh, a 40 foot wave <laughs> come and hit the buoy at Humboldt and it broke the wind turbine on the buoy. So uh, it was pretty challenging environments to deploy these buoys. Uh, and again, going and servicing, you know, all these different issues, which the wind farm or wind turbines will also experience, right? Um, 
maybe at a lower scale than than, than ours, but then at least they might. Uh, so it's going to be very challenging. And and but and so we still have one year's worth of data approximately at both of these sites, um, and all the data is publicly available on uh, the A2E DAP site or the Wind Data Hub site, which is available. Uh, we recently also have a publication that uh, has come out in Earth System Sciences Data, uh, which explains all the data uh, processing and analysis that went down with it. So that's published uh, or near publication right now. I think it's, it got accepted, but it, it's going through review. It's going through um, type editing, typesetting. So I'll start off with uh, talking a little bit about the uh, about the wind characteristics at, at that, you know, being a wind energy sort of focus. Uh, so here uh, on the top, you're seeing on the left column, uh, you're seeing the Morro Bay uh, and the right column, you're seeing Humboldt. Uh, so those are, oh, uh, this is not causing a problem here on the screen. Okay. Um, so, and and here uh, on the on the bottom, uh, on the top, you're seeing the wind roses and at the bottom you're seeing, um, uh, the wind speeds sort of bend uh, by the month of the year and the hour of the day. Uh, so it gives you sort of the half molar sort of plot, which gives you uh, sort of a sense of how the winds are varying as a function of, you know, uh, uh, an hour of the day uh, you know, for understanding the diagonal variability and then some sort of seasonal characteristics, right, of, of the thing. Um, so Morro Bay again is south, Humboldt is north. Um, and off the bat, we see that we have these distinct wind roses that we see at the both sites. And this is again, surface winds, uh, it, because we have a highest um, amount of data availability at the surface winds with LIDARs, we kind of lose availability and kind of gets muddy sometimes. So we just show you surface winds right now, but I'll have more plots for LIDAR measurements later on. Um, so here you're seeing that uh, predominantly the winds are you know, along the coast, right? Uh, li aligned along the coast. Uh, for Morro Bay, it's northwesterly winds. Um, and what we see is uh, in spring, the highest winds uh, and are observed uh, during the springtime. So that's basically around you know March, April, June, uh, April, May sort of time frame is when we start seeing the highest amount of winds, uh, where the, the surface winds kind of get up to about 10, 12 meters per second. And then uh, and and then uh, the lowest winds are observed during the summertime. So July, August, and September, uh, we start seeing really low winds, and that makes sense just because of the the the, slide, the kind of the diurnal characteristics that we see typically, or seasonal characteristics that we see uh, in offshore lease areas. Um, and from a diurnal sort of variability, uh, the peak winds are observed uh, observed around in the evening, or basically around six UTC zero 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 to six UTC. Uh, the local time is UTC minus eight. So uh, just to get your bearings right on the local time there. Um, so the Morro Bay interesting has an interesting lease area where uh, a lot of the high variability in winds is observed uh, in the high winds are observed uh, kind of in the evening time frame. Um, and this is very important for transmission uh, and, uh, and and grid balance, for example, right? So we really need to understand at what time of the day are we getting the highest winds. Um, Humboldt, on the other hand, which is northerly, uh, again, has predominantly winds that are northerly. Um, uh, spring shows high winds, with an exception to July. And, and we've looked into that a lot, and still uh, is puzzling us. Uh, so we need to look into it, that a little bit more. Um, uh, and then low winds are again observed during the summertime. There's this drastic shift that happens right about July, uh, August timeframe, uh, where we start seeing really low winds. So uh, there is a little bit of a shift in how the peak winds are observed. Uh, the peak winds or diagonal winds from a, a hour of the day are uh, are shifted here a little bit. Uh, you see strong variability in peak winds observed during nighttime, basically at around uh, eight to 15 UTC. That's when we start seeing most of the peak um, sort of variability. So uh, it was an interesting trend to see how the winds are varying as a function of space and time uh, and, and, and how the variability is uh, also uh, you know, from a seasonal characteristics, where do, where do we see, where do we expect high winds and where do we expect low winds? And again, it's important for transmission, extremely important. Um, so looking at it from, uh, So looking at it from uh, from a LIDAR perspective, you know, uh, what you're seeing on the right, on the top, you're seeing Morro Bay, uh, three plots, and then bottom, you're seeing Humboldt for the three plots. Um, the first A figure that I'm highlighting here uh, shows you like the mean average wind speed profile, uh, just to give you a sense of the shear that we see here. Uh, and, and the right, on the second plot B is basically um, a distribution of the wind directions. And you can see the uniformity in the wind directions throughout 
the LIDAR profile. Uh, and the right, we're seeing some sort of um, issues or errors, uh, not issues, but errors associated with uh, corrected versus uncorrected. Since this is a buoy, it's moving. Uh, what exactly is the impact of the motion on, on the measurements? And so we had to assess some of that as well. But overall, coming back to the physics side of things, uh, we, we see homogeneous wind directions at height at both sides. Uh, again, parallel to the coast, and consistent with what we're seeing near surface. Um, we see high shear observed in Humboldt compared to Morro Bay. Uh, and of course, here we're kind of trying to see if we're seeing more shear in stable conditions and unstable conditions. And, and we assess stability as a function of uh, air-sea temperature difference here. Uh, we don't have a thermal you know, temperature profiler, but we have uh, you know, air temperature and sea surface temperature measurements, which can give us an indication of surface um, stability. And that's how we sort of classify that. And then we see uh, a little bit of a strong variability or strong sort of shear in, um, in Humboldt uh, compared to Morrow Bay uh, in this site. And uh, we've been getting a lot of comments on uh, the impact of motion on, on, on the data and then and, and how that's actually affecting uh, the measurements and, and what we need to do. Um, what we've been seeing is that, you know, we have, we have, we have our internal sort of motion compensation sort of uh, algorithm that we've implemented. Uh, so just a small technique comment is that we see some differences in corrected versus uncorrected. And there's again, a wind cube LIDAR, which basically is having five beams uh, kind of showing, giving you a profile of measurements. Uh, so we see some errors, uh, but not significant effects of the buoy motion are observed. So if you're, if you're using corrected versus uncorrected wind speeds, um, we're not seeing huge differences in our estimates. Uh, this is with regards to mean winds and turbulence intensity. Uh, but when we start going to vertical velocity statistics, um, that's when we see large deviations or large differences associated with that. And we talk a little bit about it in that paper that I was mentioning, uh, where we see large differences in vertical velocity statistics. So there's some mo more work done, uh, you know, to understand a little bit more about the vertical velocity statistics and, and variances. But overall, from a motion compensation for mean winds, uh, there's hardly any difference. Uh, and turbulence intensity as well, we've not seen much difference associated with that. Uh, from that technique wise. So coming back to the wind characteristic side of things. So we're seeing homogeneous wind directions and high shear at Humboldt. And I, I mentioned we have sea surface temperature and air temperature measurements as well. So here uh, on the top, again, you're seeing temperature, blue is shaded for sea surface temperature, uh, orange is shaded for um, air temperature. Uh, and then Morro Bay on the first column, uh, first row, uh, Humboldt on the second, and then the bottom row is showing um, air sea temperature difference. So it just tells you how many times, I mean, what's the percentage of stability that we observe here. Uh, and, and what you're seeing is a box plot, which shows you the median and sort of uh, uh, 25, 25th and 75, 75th percentile uh, sort of um, uh, range of, of those measurements. So uh, one thing we see is a distinct seasonal trend, right? Uh, in air and sea surface temperatures uh, at both the sites, um, we're seeing that the sea surface temperature uh, is, 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 is higher most of the time uh, at Morro Bay uh, and sort of, you know, on the, uh, the flip side of it sometimes for uh, uh, for Humboldt, and this varies as a function of the, the year, right, or the, or the month. Um, and so what this tells us by looking at the difference between air and sea temperature difference is that if you're seeing a positive difference, that means it's stable. If you're seeing a negative difference, that's unstable. Um, so at Morro Bay, we predominantly end up seeing neutral or unstable uh, sort of conditions, except for June. Uh, whereas Humboldt, we see much higher percentage of stable conditions in summer and unstable conditions in the winter. So it's, it's interesting to see uh, how the stability sort of changes at both of these lease areas and how, of course, that impacts the wind profile and various things. And this is this is turned out to be an important element uh, going in some of the model comparisons. comparisons. Again, uh, I was talking about that forty foot wave that came and hit the buoy. Uh, so it's it's something that uh, you know piqued uh, our interest in terms of understanding the wave and surface roughness characteristics in this particular region. Um, so we we see the general trend we see at both the sites is that we see energetic. Uh, winters, that's where the significant wave heights are, significant wave heights are much higher, about three meters on an average or on a median uh, value, and much milder summers where the significant wave height is two meters. So 
pretty high numbers when I'm saying milder and you know it's it's two still two meters significant wave height uh, which is which is sometimes uh, you know uh, which which I've realized with deployments and, and things like that that is still a high number uh, because it, it gets really challenging uh, to go find deployment windows if you want to go service your buoy or your wind turbine um, uh, these ships can handle a certain amount of wave heights and, you know, having really high waves uh, kind of really causes a lot of problems when you're going for servicing and then trying to understand more about, you know, uh, fixing of wind turbine, for example. So this, it's, it's, it's really challenging from that aspect as well, in addition to the impact of coupling and uh, impact of waves on the boundary layer and how the momentum sort of balance ships uh, when, when the waves are higher. So uh, another observation that we saw uh, is that we saw... Uh, we saw more energetic waves at Humboldt uh, than uh, Morro Bay, and this is consistent with the theory, uh, which basically tells that you know, as uh, as from from you know the longitudinal variability along the California coast, uh, it needs to increase as it goes from the top, just mainly because of the Alaskan storms and Alaskan waves that are coming in and swells that come in from the from from the north and the west. So this this is consistent with theory, uh, but it was good to see. But we have we have a an NDBC buoy, which is a, a NOAA buoy deployed there since 1983. So a really long record. Uh, the buoys only have surface met and waves. So they don't have like a double LIDAR and things like that to give her bite winds, but they can give you surface met records for really long durations, right? Uh, and and they were, they were both, we had located the buoys close to some of these buoys as well, just so that we can do some comparisons and try to understand how, uh, how that particular year where we deploy the buoy, how is it is it consistent with the historical record? Uh, and what you're seeing here is because uh, you have these El Nino and La Nina cycles that impact the waves and, and the winds in this particular region. So it's important to understand uh, which season we're in, what kind of cycle is it going on, the, where, where exactly uh, are we lying with regards to waves and sea surface temperature, for example. Uh, we did similar sort of assessments. Uh, overall, from the historical record, it shows that um, you know this, for example, this 46022 and 46028, the orange sort of bar charts, uh, show you the NDBC buoy measurement locations. and um, and, and they show that uh, uh, overall, uh, this particular year was, um, uh, was, was a milder year uh, during the, you know, milder during, during the winter time, uh, whereas uh, was much, you know, was much harsher uh, during the summertime periods. So the waves were energetic compared to historical trend in, in the summertime, whereas were milder compared to um, uh, what we observed in, uh, in, in the winter time. Uh, so you could expect much higher wave conditions than what we're showing here. These are from the, the significant wave height estimates, what I've mentioned in the in the left here are mainly from the DOE buoy deployments. And the surface roughness was another sort of interesting uh, trend. And um, we typically end up seeing a, a multimodal sea state here uh, where you have uh, you know swell coming in from the west and then uh, you know the, the cold water coming in from from uh, from from the north and then the waves associated with that so it, it really complicates the how you describe sea surface surface roughness for example um, so but we try to do this in from you know a couple modeling perspective we had done some work there um, so we used sort of a sense of the the couple modeling perspective which is just to give you an idea of how the surface roughness here is uh, you know typically observed offshore you typically expect low surface roughness but we just wanted to quantify that and how exactly how much is that exactly um, and on the left plot here you're seeing Morro Bay on the top and then Humboldt on the bottom uh, and associated distributions on the right uh, over there. And then the colors are basically, uh, we calculate surface roughness, you know, there are multiple algorithms or, you know, formulations that you can use. You can use a Charnock principle, a simple Charnock sort of an estimate, um, uh, which is based on friction velocity, uh, but we don't have friction velocity. We wanted base, we don't have that as a, a, an output from, from the data, uh, but what we do have is significant wave height and wave period. Uh, so we can try to estimate that and then get a sense of the surface roughness, which is more um, sort of uh, an intuitive way of, of doing it. And we calculate a little bit of the friction velocity from uh, the core model, uh, kind of get an estimate of that. So this has been more of a, 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 a favored approach uh, in, in most of the simulations. And, and, and what we see here is we can use different uh, 
wave period estimates, we can either use a mean period or we can use a peak period. Um, and peak period has been, is what, you know, people, uh, for example, in Taylor in your land uh, formulation, they ask you to uh, use the peak period. Uh, but there's been a lot of recent analysis done by Woods Hole, Oceanographic Institute by um, Yoday Siu and, and Cesar Suwaj, where they show that uh, the mean period is actually a more representative state of the surface roughness. So here you can see that the surface roughness is on the of about, you know, temper negative two uh, meters, meters uh, at Morro Bay and slightly higher along uh, Humboldt. And, and and the distribution is is associated about temper negative four looks like on the mean uh, over there for both sides. So Humboldt is definitely has has a higher surface roughness, just expected. So just to give you a sense of what the surface roughness looks like. It comes in handy in some of the modeling analysis that we do. So um, last slide on the data, and I think I'm I'm going too much on this data side. Um, it's it's always sunny in California. <laughs> Uh, that we know, but it's almost always cloudy offshore. Um, so we see this map on the right is the cloud probability from 2012 through 2021 from GOES, uh, from NOAA GOES satellites. And we wanted to get a sense of, you know, how offshore clouds are behaving in this particular region. Um, uh, to give you a, a, another example, this location, I should have put markers here. This is where Humboldt is and, and Morro Bay is right down here at my marker here. And the probability is on the order of about 40, 50 to 60% of the times, if not more, we end up seeing um, cloudy conditions. So really cloudy uh, most of the time. And how that impacts the boundary layer is also a very important thing. What we end up seeing is we end up seeing really low stratus clouds. Uh, so the stratiform clouds affect the boundary layer uh, turbulence and, and, and the winds. And, and it's very important to understand how this goes in. And this, this has been uh, a challenge for a lot of the climate modeling uh, and also reanalysis models to accurately predict uh, the winds at, you know, uh, at these locations just because of uh, you know, lack of data simulation, for example, right, uh, in terms of winds um, and, and the dynamics associated with that. So uh, again, at these two locations, we also had a pyranometer, I missed mentioning that, so we can get a sense of the cloud fraction uh, in this particular location. Uh, overall, just to quickly wrap up this particular side, we see more clouds uh, in the summertime uh, compared to the wintertime and more clouds in the in, at Mora Bay near the south compared to the north. So slightly uh, different sort of uh, reasons. And I'll get, you know, I may get into that a little bit later, but uh, in the interest of time, I'll kind of keep moving on. So uh, I, I was mentioning about coastal low-level jets uh, in this particular case. And in, in the summer, uh, the North Pacific high and the thermal lows over uh, the Southwest US sort of result in uh, an enhanced cross coastline pressure gradient that primarily drives the uh, northerly wind here. And this sort of picture here shows you, shows you, um, you know, some of the some of the drivers that cause this low level jet in the summertime. And we have a paper out in monthly weather review that's going to come out uh, that just got accepted. So it's going to come out very soon, talk a little bit more about this. Um, and at the top of the marine boundary layer, as you can see in the schematic here, um, a low level jet is typically observed that's uh, along the coastline uh, due to the thermal wind sort of concept, which is uh, land sea thermal gradients, right? Uh, this enhanced land sea thermal gradients uh, changes sort of the dynamics and pushes the the, the low level jet closer. Uh, and just because of the steep topography to the right, uh, it creates this gradient, which uh, which results in which results in this coastal baroclinity, uh, which which basically is the difference with the pressure and the and the and the thermal gradient uh, along the coastline and coming close to the coast, and and results in this northerly flow and coastal low level jet. So very interesting phenomena very well studied uh, sort of phenomena along along the West Coast. Uh, so we know a lot about this, but then we what we don't know is how the winter, uh, what is the percentage of low level jets that are observed uh, from an annual cycle at this particular location in the wind turbine sort of rotor layers. So that's something that is, is important to assess. Uh, and and what we see here on the, on the bottom plot is we show the low level jet height characteristics. The core height characteristics at, at top is uh, is actually Humboldt. Sorry to flip this again on you. Uh, top is Humboldt and the bottom is Morro Bay. And we see that we're, we're seeing some low level jets happening um, in the rotor layer winds, uh, rotor layer sort of measurements. Our measurements are limited. Um, you could be seeing more low level jets above, right? For example, at 500 or 300 or 400 meters, which the LIDAR is not capturing. 
so, but you know, at Morro Bay, we see probably more higher winds, higher low-level jets, and that's what the model is not capturing, or the data is not capturing on the bottom. Uh, whereas at Morro Bay, we see more low-level jets that are much closer uh, and shallower. So you can see that the peak is about 140 meters here at Morro Bay on the bottom. Um, which I was mentioning about the rotor layer winds, rotor hub height is about 170 meters. So a really interesting sort of phenomena and, and, and very relevant uh, to what a lot of work has been going on on low level jets and, and impact on wind turbines. So this is gonna add to that challenge that I was talking about. So uh, going into the second topic, I've kind of given you a, hopefully given you a picture of how the observations are in that region, right? What are the phenomena? What what exactly are we seeing from the data sets? Uh, what are the measurement trends? Um, and and it 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 sort of made like an, a next immediate step is to see how exactly are these reanalysis models performing. So uh, so we uh, we took upon ourselves to kind of look at various reanalysis models. Uh, we chose a set of reanalysis models. You know, I'm sure that we could add more. Um, Again, so but there are MIRA2, CFS, uh, NAR, ERA5, and Rapid Refresh, which is the uh, which is uh, RAP for short. Uh, so there, there's there are different things that I mentioned here in terms of the grid spacing and you know uh, spatial coverage and then temporal output frequency and from when was the data available um, and then what is the nearest grid point to that. On uh, the right, you're seeing sort of an averaged um, uh, wind speed map. Uh, at various levels, right? Uh, the issue with reanalysis is that we get, you know, uh, the standard output is at different out different heights. And MIRA, for example, provides 50 meter heights, but doesn't provide, you know, um, uh, other heights. CFS similarly wrap ERA five has 100 meter uh, resolution, but you can you can output the high resolution output, uh, but then we've kind of looked take, taken the the basic output that we get uh, from some of these reanalysis to get an initial quick assessment of that. Um, and off the bat, you see some differences in in all of these plots. Um, they have uh, different some different characteristics, but overall, they show winds coming from northerly. You know, uh, you see some of these expansion fans happening uh, associated uh, in this particular location. So consistent, but subtle differences, right? And some differences highlight a little bit more uh, than others. Um, and, and, and at the bottom, what I'm showing is sort of a distribution of the wind speeds and, and how various um, models are, are behaving here and all at surface, right? At just surface, just to get a sense. And we also thrown in the satellite measurements just to see if, uh, you know, with the temporal sampling that we get from satellite data sets, um, how well is that, you know, uh, to the long-term distribution that we're observing in the site. And overall, I can I can quickly move on from this slide very quickly saying that, um, uh, you know, uh, RAP, which is the rapid refresh, uh, seems to be most consistent with the observations. Uh, ERA 5 is consistent, but, you know, uh, there are some issues sometimes uh, uh, when you get very close to the coast, and it doesn't really represent the true winds uh, accurately at this location. Uh, the rapid refresh has a as as a much higher uh, accuracy, and the other models sort of lie somewhere in between, uh, from from Mira two being uh, sort of worse to uh, say CFS, and and they really come into picture uh, just because of because I think the the resolution of these models is so different. So um, you know some of these are expected, and then. But yeah, just to give you an analysis, RAP and ERA5 performed uh, the best in terms of looking at how uh, that, and CFS was very close as well. So some of the reanalysis model errors uh, that we had tried to take a look at was, uh, is there a trend that we're seeing here in terms of um, uh, atmospheric stability? Right. And, and really close to the surface, MO theory has been the most prominent sort of way to extrapolate winds and and we want to see uh, is the wind speed bias that's basically model minus observations how is that affected uh, uh, offshore so here we're showing you um, on the top Humboldt and the bottom Morro Bay uh, the, the the leftmost plots are buoy observations uh, which is showing you the sh the, the shear uh, from the 40 meter winds from the lidar and four meter winds from the surface and various sort of MO theory sort of results, which is Pusinga Dyer, Bell Johnson Hoslack, and Bakerson Mott uh, for both the sites. And, and on the rightmost plot, you're seeing the model bias at, at here um, for various reanalysis as a function of the atmospheric stability or uh, the stability, which is Z over L. And again, L is calculated using the core model 
uh, 3.5 sort of version model. Uh, and I can get into details on that if someone's interested. But overall, we see uh, a pretty uh, uh, it, you know, uh, known trend, I guess I should say, uh, is that you know, during stable conditions, uh, we're seeing higher biases from the models. And we're seeing more of that at Humboldt than at Model Bay. Um, and then from an observational sense, we're seeing that the the observations are closer to Belgias and Holzlag sort of approximations um, uh, in, 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 in the shear profiles compared to some of the others that were developed, like because Anmat was developed using West Coast data, but much south of the location. So it doesn't really represent the scale sometimes. You can see that changed here, but I'll, I'll leave that for now. Um, the other source of reanalysis model errors, we started looking at that again as in Hoff-Muller plot, uh, trying to see uh, where the variability lies. And again, I'll, I'll kind of quickly go on this um, in the interest of time is that summer months show overestimation uh, of models, especially ERA-5. Uh, you, uh, you can see that drastic shift here on the bottom there, as if we can see my cursor. We can start seeing negative biases, and then you start see, suddenly seeing over uh, estimations. Uh, RAP, provides consistent negative biases. So it's a known devil uh, in this particular location. And, um, and it shows you larger biases at night and, and then during daytime. Um, it captures the local mesoscale phenomena well, for example, Santana winds or wind ramp events. Uh, it's, it's, it's observed to characterize that well. Of course, it's a high resolution model compared to ERA-5. So uh, the takeaway message was that if you improve the resolution of the model, that is also one of the reasons why you would start getting better uh, Better output. So, uh, RAP in this particular area has has consistent results. It does have one caveat. There is that the model physics has been changing quite a bit in the model. So uh, it's again an analysis, not reanalysis. I should specify that. Um, so the model physics has been changing on on that, uh, which kind of complicates if you're looking for a long term perspective. So uh, going into WERF modeling, um, and I'll try to wrap up. Uh, hopefully soon here, is um, we, we, we ran some WERF models here uh, for one year long WERF models. And this was done with uh, collaboration with Enril, uh, Nicola Bodini and his team, uh, and Car Carolina Draxel and her team, uh, kind of looking at the one year long WERF simulations that were compared, uh, and they were compared with buoy observations in this particular region. Um, so what they saw uh, immediately using these buoy observations was that the overall bias uh, from the WERF model, which was run again at grid, re grid resolutions of about two kilometers uh, across this entire domain. Um, and, and they saw that the biases, overall bias was pretty high at Humboldt, uh, was higher at Humboldt, uh, it was about two meters per second. Um, and, uh, and at Morro Bay was about a meter per second compared to the forcing data that went in there was ERA-5. Um, and they were doing a 20 year run. So it made sense to have ERA-5 instead of RAP just because of the complications I mentioned with regards to model physics. Um, so looking at this particular run, they, they, it was kind of astonishing to see why that bias was happening, quite quite large bias at Humboldt. So, uh, you know, uh, so there are a lot of reasons why we were thinking that this could happen just because of reanalysis forcings, like, okay, maybe not, uh, sea surface temperature input, uh, choice of PBL scheme, surface layer scheme. We're, we, in this particular model, they were not coupling the wind and wave ocean. Um, and, uh, and is that causing some of these biases? Uh, and then the cloud coverage. So a lot of unknowns and, and something that we had to dig into. Uh, so what we immediately saw was that the choice of PBL scheme, and I, we've done all the analysis for the other errors, but the choice of PBL scheme stood out um, where we, we were using YSU compared to MYNN, and that really reduced the biases. And as you can see in the top lot here, uh, both at Humboldt and Morro Bay, the overall biases right now is, is pretty close to zero um, and a little bit of uh, variability. And, and it showed that the YSU people scheme, which basically is a, a non-local scheme, whereas MYNN is, is, is a closure PBL scheme. You're seeing some issues associated with that and, and how, um, how YSU scheme treats clouds compared to MYN. Uh, so there are some issues, you know, where we can, uh, the paper that I was mentioning from Yale uh, uh, explains a lot about this and I'll go a little bit into this. So overall, summer and spring months showed the largest biases here and, and, and have the most interesting local dynamics that we've explained before. Um, and overall, so we see, we see that the YSU is explaining a lot of that. And, and we wanted to dig a little bit deeper into what were some of the characteristics that were happening 
So we we did a lot of case study analysis here, uh, uh, looking at uh, cases where we saw large errors between the California 20 output, which is the WOF output from NREL, uh, to the observations, and we saw cases where there were large errors, and we started digging deeper into that. Um, and and this is where we saw the thermal wind, which is basically the Lancy thermal gradient. Uh, creates this you know, it's a strong paraclinic zone close to the surface uh, and close to the, the coast uh, that drives the low level jet. And that impacted a lot of the dynamics here. So what you're seeing here is a bit of a busy plot. I'm sorry, um, is on the, on the left here, you're seeing um, the, for that particular given case study, you're seeing the air temperature. And uh, on the right, you're seeing the V wind that's coming into you uh, and then, uh, the difference between MOINN and YSU air temperature at the bottom here, and then again, the difference in the wind uh, that's coming in. So it just use the, the, the wind vector uh, coming into you. So what we uh, easily saw was that close to the coast, as you can see MOINN, um, MOINN was uh, uh, over predicting the, the surface temperature or what, had a warm bias uh, in, in that particular location, which caused this Lancy thermal gradient to enhance. And, and that resulted in um, over prediction of the low level jets uh, associated for some of these cases. Uh, and then on the right, again, you're seeing um, sort of perturbations in due to the capes associated in this particular region. You have the Cape Blanco and Cape Mendocino, which sort of, uh, sort of affects the data quite a bit. And our buoy is uh, amazingly located right in that sort of sweet zone there, um, which which is sort of the wake of the Cape Blanco. So, so it's it's a bit sensitive location, uh, as you can see. So uh, there's a lot of variability um, in um, uh, and gradients that we see both horizontally and vertically in this particular location. So Humboldt is definitely an interesting uh, site uh, which has a lot of the uh, the Lancy thermal contrast. It also has the uh, cape effects or the terrain effects, which complicates the the picture here a little bit. But I'll I'll move on here. But overall, just to give you why MON is overestimating, uh, it was the Lancy thermal gradient uh, between uh, the 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 coast uh, and 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 the and the ocean, uh, but then uh, the warm bias in MYNN schemes was was mainly due to insufficient low level cloud cover. Um, the, the, there was a modification done, which is the EDMF scheme, but that doesn't really help uh, offshore. It's mostly near the coast or onshore. Uh, and atmospheric stability was also one of the drivers for that. So, um, so I'll maybe take a couple more minutes uh, and then uh, I'll try to wrap things up here. I know we're running out a little bit of time. Um, the finally, you know, we started looking at coupled modeling um, as 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 a source here, uh, trying to see if there was um, there were some errors associated with that. Um, so we use the coast setup, which is the coupled ocean atmosphere wave sediment transport model. Um, and we've tested a two-way coupled sort of simulations for this particular region. Um, Covost is a great setup, uh, and it gives you uh, the, I, on the top right. I show you sort of the some of the uh, uh, parameters that are swapped between various models and and how that coupling exactly happens. And at the bottom, I'm showing you the sort of the domains uh, for the on the left for the WERF domain, and the right for the WAVEMOS3 domain. Um, the coupling was done uh, in the Covost setup is typically done using MYNN scheme with WaveWatch 3 uh, you, you know, near the surface. Um, but we had to, when we saw the YSU was performing much better, uh, we had to modify the code uh, to uh, to add the YSU scheme in coupling with the WaveWatch 3, which basically uses some of these parameters, the wave height and significant wave height and, 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 and the period. So uh, one case that I want to show today, uh, there are a lot more cases. One case I want to show today and kind of some take home message uh, from this particular thing, from our experience in coupled modeling. Uh, and I'm sure there's more that we're digging into right now, but this is just our initial experiences, is that uh, for some of the high wave or high wave cases that we feel coupled modeling is really going to add value or, or show errors, uh, and, and we wanted to assess what that errors were, um, we had a cold frontal passage uh, happening when the buoys were deployed around February 12, 2021. Um, so we've assessed that case. Uh, so one take home message again uh, is that um, the waves state uh, is better represented in a coupled model uh, compared to a standalone model. 
So by a standalone model, I mean uh, you take um, just the input from a given uh, Wolf model or reanalysis model and drive the wave towards three. Uh, whereas a couple model where you're having this feedback loop, right? Um, and, and we're seeing that in a couple modeling sense, uh, this uh, is much better uh, uh, represented. So here on the left, you're seeing some buoy observations with WERF uh, and baseline simulations. And by baseline, I mean just standalone wave was three. Uh, and then WERF is basically the coupled version of it. And, and you can see that this blue line uh, sort of matches the, uh, the buoy observations quite well. Uh, whereas the orange line is basically the baseline simulation and you're seeing large errors and, and sort of offsets with regards to uh, the frequent in the frequency space, at least, um, where you're looking at, say, swell conditions or, you know, uh, long wave and short wave sort of conditions. Um, and so immediately off the bat, you can see that clear difference and you can also see uh, the, 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 the period uh, in, in this particular case and, and the wave and the significant wave height sort of match the observations quite well. For this particular case. So one thing that we can definitely say uh, with a lot of confidence is that the wave state is going to be well represented in a two-way configuration. Um, we looked at winds quite a bit. Uh, uh, the winds show some trends in improvement um, overall. Uh, in, in this particular case, you're seeing uh, various lines at about 100 meters, right? The LIDAR at 100 meters, the WERF only, one-way coupled WERF, two-way coupled WERF. Um, and you can see uh, it's not it's not very clear uh, if you know the uh, if the performance of one way versus two way couple this is is uh, is significantly improving. Uh, this has a lot to do with reanalysis forcing errors and things like that. Uh, I can get more deeper into this if someone has any questions on this, and we have a manuscript in preparation on that. Uh, but we are doing we we've come to a conclusion that doing just short runs and simulations is 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 giving us mixed results for different cases. Uh, so we are in another project which I'll show which I'll sh mention closely. We're doing a, a one year long three way coupled, including ROMs, uh, just to see how the overall uncertainties are changing in this particular kind of simulations. So a uh, last sort of slide, a uh, couple of slides looking at the multi scale modeling approach we have reanalysis models, which are much larger scale, then dying down to WERF scales. And then we've been doing, we've been started doing a lot more analysis in LES scales as well. Um, so here is because we're seeing a lot of the impacts of clouds and we want to understand how the clouds are affecting the offshore wind turbines uh, and, and, uh, and the turbulence that are generated by the offshore clouds. So the clouds typically end up having higher turbulence cases, conditions observed. Um, so we, uh, We've, we've run multiple cases. We use uh, 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 internal code called Pinnacles, uh, and there's sort of a, uh, a you know a new code that uh, you know a, a colleague of ours called Kyle Pressel at PNL has been developing, and it's 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 really fast. Uh, it's an, an elastic code compared to compressible code, so it's much faster uh, in that scheme. It it has uh, higher order numerics uh, like the Wino schemes, which basically improves the uh, the way it's performing. It can be uh, right now it's not GPU, but it's very soon going to be in in a GPU mode. Uh, there's a PBL that's a shock scheme. That's from E3SM. So there are a lot of different, you know, I mentioned this, I can share this slide later on um, for people who want to know. And if you want Kyle uh, to get more details on that. But from, from that, we I'll just show you one case. Again, it was a frontal passage case. Um, and here we use uh, nested simulations to perform LES at about 55 meter grids resolutions, horizontal grid resolution spacing uh, for conditions that are observed near Morro Bay, just south. Um, and the initial and lateral lateral boundary conditions are forced from her here, which is uh, which is the the the, the model that uh, RAP sort of develops uh, at a much higher resolution, about one kilometer. Um, the outer coast resolution is about 420 kilometers by 420 kilometers here, uh, so it's a pretty large domain. Um, and the inner fine domain here is about 40 kilometers by 40 kilometers. So a pretty big LES simulation covering most of the Morro Bay lease area, as you can see here in the red outline. Um, and what you're seeing here is ghost sort of cloud image um, uh, or reflectivity image, and then uh, the pinnacle sort of an estimate of the albedo uh, at, at different resolutions at 500 meters, which is the slightly outer domain, and then 55 meters, which is at the inner domain. So, um, and, and then we see 
we see this is the initial spin up time uh, right about till here uh, as the spin up of the pinnacles models and you see the the data slowly sort of getting better and better and it kind of starts matching with the observations that's in the black line at both resolutions and what we see is that the the pinnacles model sort of outperforms her which has data simulation involved in it as well so uh, some initial promising results uh, that we're seeing. Uh, so um, uh, it's it's definitely interesting and we have the future steps. We have this really awesome project that we're uh, working on right now with Sue uh, as well and, and many other collaborators here on uh, the project called Oracle, which sort of you know gets more deeper into the physics of various things. We're creating a database, um, Couple wave atmosphere, LES, and then climate change work that's led by Sue. So there's a lot of interesting work that's happening on this particular West Coast. Um, and, and I'll skip this slide and thank everyone for your time and hope I didn't make it too much. Uh, so if I have any questions. Oh, that was uh, fascinating, Raghu. You hear the virtual applause. Um, you know, really interesting talk. So I'll invite people to ask questions either by raising your hand and unmuting or uh, typing your question in the chat. While we're waiting for others, maybe I'll start off, Raghu. Um, sure. I know you did a lot of uh, you know study off the east coast of the U.S. too, yes. um, you know, which of course is very shallow. What are the major differences, you know, in wind characteristics between the east and the west coast of the U.S.? Good question. Uh, so what we see is that the winds are. Um, in terms of the uh, the seasonal characteristics, uh, we see uh, pretty se pretty similar seasonal characteristics where the spring is is um, is, um, is so shows higher winds and the summer shows lower winds and and winters. Uh, the the those are some of the similarities, but then the timing of the 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 high winds in, from a diurnal sense is different. Uh, we see that as a difference in in the west coast compared to the east coast, and again in the west coast we see that difference uh, in in among the sites. Um, the other issue is also that the west coast has much shallow boundary layers compared to the east coast. So the east coast typically you would expect a boundary layer, convective boundary layer, about a kilometer or so, uh, whereas here you would see about 200 to 300 meters as a boundary layer. That really impacts um, the low-level jet characteristics close to the coast um, and and um, and and the winds that are associated with that. Um, and then we also have the terrain effects, which are much more significant in the west coast than in the east coast. So overall, we are seeing really two different states of um, of atmospheric conditions. So if you're looking at East Coast and saying, okay, you know what, now I know I have a sense of how West Coast is gonna look like, you're gonna you're gonna be in for some huge surprises, mm -hmm. is what we think. Okay, Jakob. Yes, um, thank you very much, Raku, for your very nice presentation. Uh, you said you had a lot of uh, low clouds, um, sort of cumulus clouds. Uh, what about the availability of the lighters uh, at, 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 at the height should go up to like 300 meters? Uh, yeah. Do they affect the profiles or are there any biases there that you have to take care of? You, yeah, yeah. So we do see um, when we get, uh, if it's fog, we've seen that the measurements are okay. Uh, they don't affect the measurements too much, you know, uh, but if you if you start getting much thicker clouds and the availability reduces quite a bit at 300 meters. Uh, right now, our availability at 300 meters was about 50 to 60%. Um, so that would indeed affect some of the biases. And, you know, we saw that in low level jet characteristics, you know, we're not able to capture the low level jets that are slightly above. Um, uh, but yeah, that's that's an inherent artifact in, in the measurements itself. Mm -hmm. So in W54, we're hoping that we'll have a much high powered lidar uh, in there, which will at least you know give a good sense of that. So this was an initial sort of pre-campaign with the buoys, but we'll have to think of some innovative ways to measure above the clouds, which we don't have yet. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Adam. 
Hi, Raghu. Thank you for this really interesting and early morning talk. Uh, it was really cool to hear about all the like phenomena that we have uh, here in California. And I was kind of wondering, you showed that the wind speeds uh, like kind of like drop off in July and August. Uh, and you just mentioned in relation to Sue's question, how that's similar to some observations you've seen on the East Coast. But uh, we also generally like associate summer with like the heavy fog season. And do you think that like those wind speeds are decreasing due to like the fog or other sort of uh, like large scale like forces? Yeah, I think I think that's the marine layer winds have a huge effect on that. Uh, so the inversion uh, gets really close to the surface and, and and you get these expansion fans that happen associated with that. But fog definitely uh, is, uh, is, is, has shown a little bit of an effect on why the winds are lower. Uh, but there are a lot of other things as well that happen. Uh, you know, uh, there, the, the, there is a, a North Pacific high and, and the thermal low that's observed, you know, on the inlands uh, that creates that northerly winds. But then the, the low, like the coastal upwelling phenomena is also another factor that actually reduces mm -hmm. a lot of this. Uh, winds that we we see observed. So there's it's a it's a compounded effect that we see, but definitely the marine layer winds is is on the top of the chart there, which creates these foggy conditions. Um, cool. Offshore. And how like how short are those like inversions? Do you have like a number? Yeah. So from model observations, you know, we could get like a slightly better estimate. Uh, the inversions are sometimes go up to about forty meters. Wow, cool. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Okay, we have a question in the chat from Jim Brasseur. Uh, could you please explain in more detail how you estimated Z naught in slide 10? Yeah, uh, so that's based on, let me go back to that slide. That's based on the Taylor your land uh, formulation and observations. So let me uh, go back. Uh, it's a bit long back here. Ah, there you go. Uh, so this is the formulation that I've shown you at the, at the bottom. Uh, so this is this is how we uh, estimate that uh, the significant wave height and the wave period are estimated from the buoy observations and friction velocity is estimated from the core model 3.5 associated with that. So where did that expression come from? This this expression here, uh, this yes. is from this this paper called Taylor and Yulan, two thousand one. So they've okay. done they've done a lot of uh, observations of um, East Coast, uh, and they have uh, this formulation estimated from that. There are multiple variations of this formulation. Um, there's this, and there are a couple of other formulations that have uh, different factors associated with surface roughness and period. Okay, so you mentioned that you don't know you stars. So how do you use this? Using the core three point five, which is a bulk flux method. Um, so we have to um, we get that mainly from uh, at the surface. The input for the core model is it uses the surface uh, bulk winds and then gives you an estimate of the flux based on MO theory. Okay. All right. Thanks. Now, another one from the chat from uh, Anna Maria Semperviva, um, and just asking how how big is the planned wind farm and at what distance from the shore? And uh, she's saying that you said that due to the distance of the location, the sea breeze is not an issue, but the extension of the wind farm and of the breeze can be important when the breeze starts and ends part of the wind farm could might be in the sea breeze and the rest outside with different wind speeds. Absolutely. I completely agree with that statement. So I, I should have not mentioned that explicitly. Uh, when I said that, uh, I basically meant that the um, wind directions that we observe at these two sites are predominantly northerly. We don't see any uh, winds coming in from the coast. Uh, but you're absolutely right, Anna, is that the uh, the importance of sea breeze and, and, and the spatial variability of it um, uh, could be a factor in, in how the marine boundary layer dynamics is, is 
is being operated in certain these conditions. So the land sea thermal gradient and things like that. Have you seen that as some of the effects um, and how that modulates the low level jet? So it's definitely important. Uh, I was mainly talking from the uh, the observations where we're not seeing that. So yeah, thanks mm -hmm. for the clarification. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, say Ahana Roy. Um, I believe you have your hand up, and I'm sorry I'm saying your name wrong. Is Sayahana still here? Okay. Um, yeah, unmute if you're going to ask a question, please. Okay, let's move on to Jali. Uh, thank you. So, hey, Rago, thank you for hey. the presentation. I have a quick question. I noticed you showed this um, uh, one single case simulations uh, between wharf and, and, and coupled wharf with ocean waves. And, and it seems like there was not much difference in terms of the peaks and all those. Um, of course, it's a, a, a single study and we can draw a conclusion over there. But I wonder whether some, for example, wave uh, component process was considered there in this model, for example, the non-breaking wave bringing the, the cool water up to the, the surface, which could possibly uh, decrease the intensity. Right, so in this, you know, um, thanks, Yali. Uh, in this, you know, the sea surface temperature is prescribed. So we have satellite, you know, measurements of sea surface temperature, which tells you a little bit of the coastal upwelling. We did not do a three-way coupled. Uh, this was just a mm -hmm. two-way coupled model. So we just have the wave watch three and raw, uh, you know, WERF. Um, and and the, the main input from ROMs typically here is the sea surface temperature, right? Uh, which is prescribed uh, for this particular case. But you're right, there could be some effects of the coastal upwelling that uh, could change the you know the surface friction velocity, which in turn could change the, um, uh, which in turn could change the wave characteristics and 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 associated with that the profile. So we're not looking at that. We've done a few simulations here, and we've really gotten mixed results when we're doing case studies. <laughs> so it's not mm -hmm. been very concrete. And I agree with you is that. So we're in this particular project with Sue. We're doing a, sort of a one or two year sort of simulation, trying to capture a long term trend of some of these cases and we're doing we're doing a three-way model including ROMs there so hopefully next time uh, I can I can share more details on that thank you thank you Raghu yep. you bet okay so um we have gone over time this was a fascinating seminar and we thank you for staying to answer our questions um but I think we'll end now um Jakob, would you like to announce the next seminar on November? I believe it is eighth. Uh, yeah, November eighth. Uh, that's Helge Ugo Massen, who is going to talk uh, from DTU Wind, and he's going to talk about uh, new induction models, some theory, new theory about induction models for wind turbines. So we will send out the, the uh, flyer and uh, have a link for you to attend the seminar. Okay, thanks everyone and uh, see you next month. Thanks, thanks everyone. Bye. You, bye-bye.